Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. It is so good to see you. Please stand and join us as we worship today. Two, three, four. Come all ye weary, come all ye thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all ye sinners, come find his mercy, come to the table he will satisfy. JC and Patty are out of town this week, so I was told I'll be subbing just making announcements, so just very briefly make a few announcements here. I do want to introduce uh, Mark Hayes, who will be bringing us uh, word this morning. Uh, Mark and his wife Christy live in Rutherford County, and actually he has a tie to the church, uh, having previously served years ago with the Long family in Union City, is that correct, years ago? and. Um, also, from what I have learned, he is a, uh, a good friend of Barry Huntsinger. We're still going to let him preach, <laughs> despite that, but uh, so, so Mark is, uh, is known here, and we look forward to uh, what he's going to bring us this morning. Uh, announcements, fairly brief. 
Uh, we do, deacons have a meeting after service. I would anticipate that also being a brief one, but we'll just meet here after service uh, quickly. Uh, I will also say, I think this needs to be recognized. Tomorrow on the 11th, Gene and Marilyn Legg will celebrate 70 years together. So God is certainly to be praised for that, and we congratulate them on 70 years together. Uh, I do hate to end on this note, but Davis Burkhalter wants to come up here and say something. <laughs> You know why he hates to end on that note? Because I'm fixing to ask him from the nominating committee to do something. No, seriously. We are really, really, really close to having all our positions filled. One thing I want the church to be thinking about in the next few weeks. If you're on the nominating committee, would you please stand so I won't forget somebody this week? Pam, Brooks, over here, Paul, Vivian, back there in the back of myself. <coughs> Uh, we may be coming to, you, to, to some of y'all and asking you, would you be willing to serve in the nursery during the preaching service once every three months? That's, that's not that often. Once every three months, go back there in the nursery and serve. If I can get a list of enough people to do that, I don't think I'll have any problem getting somebody to put you in a rotation. And we've got, and if you wouldn't be as a sub, as, you know, when there will be times that pre people are out, but if you'll be willing to sub. And so that, that's one of our big things right now. And we've got a couple of teachers positions left open, but we're close to getting all of them filled. So just be praying about it. If the nominating committee approaches you to do something, we have already prayed about it. So and you've been placed on our hearts to ask. So if you tell us, well, let me pray about it, we've already prayed about it, and God placed y'all on our hearts. That's why we're coming to you. So anyway, thank you so much for those people that have stepped up and are willing to serve. And I will be asking Adam later about doing something. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> Let us pray. Fathers, we come to you in prayer, dear, dear and Father. We just uh, play, pray you keep our pastor, Brother Jay and Patty, safe as they travel this week. Bring them home safely to us next week. We pray for this guest speaker today that you anoint him, dear and Father, and Jonathan as he leads the singing. And we just ask you right now to bind Satan out of this building, dear and Father. Father, for the tithes and offerings that we're uh, going to be taking up, just use them to further thy kingdom and each and every family that's represented here this uh, week. Protect them, keep them safe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? If our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand again? What could stand again? The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. Darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. Oh, my God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. And I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Backing down from any giant, I know how the story ends. I know how the story ends. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. Turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for me, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good, and I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to the Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to the Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. And I heard an old, old story. Our Savior came from glory. Now we came.
much for that victory. Thank you for the cross. An instrument of shame, of death, and you turn it in to a symbol of victory. Thank you so much for that, for the empty grave. All of it to make a way for us to come home. We love you so much, Lord. We honor you today and every day. With the words that we say today, everything that we do, Lord, let it be to your glory. And let us truly be your people. In your holy name, we all say, amen. Please be seated. David, am I on? Good deal. Good deal. It's a privilege this morning to be here. It's an honor. It's a privilege for all of us to be here, especially in a world that we live in today filled with total uncertainty. You can't ever tell what's going to happen from day to day. It's a blessing just to be in a house of God where we have the freedoms that we do. Mr. Christian called me, a pastor called me and asked me to fill in this morning this evening and it's a blessing and an honor to be here and I appreciate it. So uh, a little bit of background about myself. Uh, I am uh, married. I've been married for just right at 33 years. Christy don't hold that against me. It's right at 33 years plus plus or minus maybe a month. I got three full grown kids. I got four grand boys uh, and, uh, and we're doing really well. God has blessed us and uh, so I, I'm, I am a veteran. I spent uh, seven years in the Marine Corps as a helicopter crew chief on CH-46s from 83 to 87 for you veterans. And I'm also, I, was, uh, I worked with uh, Mr. Jack Long for years at the Beulah Baptist Association, West Tennessee. I did all the youth mission projects and work for our association. I would take small churches with uh, very few membership and like say that uh, a, a person uh, a senior would know how to lay brick or block or vinyl siding. I would take that man and, and plug some young people in with him and his job was to teach them that craft or skill and we would use that every year from then on. And some of the people that they taught through the years are still, they're still doing it. So that, that's God sent. So we did that for a long time. Uh, how I uh, met Barry, I just want to kind of, uh, by the way, Cynthia, I know that God's grace is sufficient, and if you're married to Barry, you also believe it too. Uh, I'm just saying. Uh, I met Barry in an odd way uh, when 
Christ sent me to Middle Tennessee, uh, not kicking and screaming. I did it because Christ wanted me to, and I just said, let's go to Middle Tennessee. I got hired on at Nissan. And uh, I, my background is a machinist, so I'm looking for steel to use to machine parts with, and they were kind of, uh, it was kind of hard to come by. Uh, they sent me, a guy carried me down to Barry's area. I met Barry for the first time, and we uh, became a relationship there. Well, then when they made me a maintenance supervisor, they sent me from one plant uh, area all the way to the other end of the spectrum, and believe it or not, I became Barry's supervisor for almost eight years. So I know, Miss Cynthia, the troubles and trials that you go through on a daily basis. <coughs> If you've had to ever heard frogs <clears throat> or work with a handful of 12-year-olds at any time, you've got Barry Huntsanger. <laughs> and, and that's a good thing. Barry's a great person. I'm just, just, we stay on each other all the time. So he's a blessing to be around. He's an, he's an encouraging person, so just be mindful of that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Let's bow our heads. I'm looking at you, okay? Everybody bow your heads. Everybody bow your heads. I'm looking at you right now. If you're going through something this morning, you're in a weird, hard place in your life, just be mindful we have a God that's in heaven that sent his son to die for you so you could be, uh, you'd have security knowing that God's taking care of that problem. The Bible also says, uh, gird up the loins of your mind, take control of your mind. Mind play tricks on you. Let it not play tricks on you this morning. Let, uh, let it be open-minded and let it uh, adhere to the Word and, and knowing that you've got help. It's like throwing a life preserver for you. And God's here for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you, dear Lord, for this day. You said this is the day the Lord has made. Rejoice and be glad in it. <clears throat> I pray, dear Lord, most of all that you... You watch my body language, my language itself, uh, uh, direct the words out of my mouth, but make it very clear, your message this morning. Uh, let it be a help meet to someone here. If there's a person that's lost, that has no idea who you are, and needs salvation this morning, I pray that this would be the day, uh, most of all. Uh, dear God, I thank you for the love and kindness you've already shown us this morning at this church. I pray, dear God, that uh, you let the Holy Spirit uh, just move on us this morning and let us be your people. We love you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. I pray and ask it. Amen. <clears throat> I apologize about the sinuses. I, the weirdest thing is I have hardly ever have sinus problems except this morning. That's the way it always is. It's just like when you get up and you get ready to go to church. You want to do the right thing, your kids can't find their shoes, you can't find their clothes, they won't eat right, they're slow, you tell them to speed up, they slow down. They, I mean, it's just like this weird thing that happens on Sunday morning, it's this weird dynamic, you end up in Bermuda Triangle of Life on Sunday morning, and that's why I said gird up the loins of your mind, because it's real easy to get distracted when you're headed this way and somebody pulls out in front of you, and oh Lord, it's, you know, uh, Road rage sets in, and next thing you know, you downward spiral. So let, just let that all stay outside. But what I want to talk to you about this morning, we're going to end up in 2 Samuel. But uh, initially, I want to talk to you about David. Have you ever read in the Bible, there's different characters in the Bible that intrigue me. One of them is David. David, when he went to, to <laughs> and the, the fight the battle, you know, he picked the five stones up. The giant. And he, uh, he met for the first time, probably the first time he'd ever run into a big army. Here's a sheep herder running to, from nobody. They wanted to call Jonathan. They called Jonathan. They said, we won't get Jonathan. He's, a, he's one uh, encouraging guy. He is a, a courageous guy. Let's call John, Saul's son. Let's get him in here and let's get him to fight the giant. We know, why wouldn't Saul do it? I have no idea, but let's get Jonathan to do it. David shows up with the five stones. We won't go into all that. I think he picked up five stones because he's seen four more of the giants standing in the, in the vestibule outside somewhere he knew he was going to have to throw four more 
And God, he, had, he, didn't, he couldn't even wear the armor. It was too big for David. And David said, I can't fight this battle like this. I don't want this armor. You know what? He, he had God's armor on him. That's what he had. God's all over him. And then when the giant stepped out, he ended up, you know the story, hurled the stone and got the giant. Well, in the, after it was all said and done, him and Jonathan, the Bible says in 1 Samuel, they get sit down, basically got to talking. And Jonathan and, saw, and David's souls were knit together. They became friends. Like greater friends than even a husband and wife. Not a, a, a immoral type love. It was a love like you, you never have, you know. As I'm over 20, as I get older, I realize friendships are hard to come by sometimes. And at, at my age... You'll realize, young people, sometimes you realize you can count the, the, your best friends probably on one hand. People you can actually trust. I hear sometimes people say, you know, um, cowboys, they only get one a good horse. I'm not a horse guy, but you know, you want a good horse. One dog. I got a little dog, little dog. He's a great little dog, but he's the best dog we've ever had. You have one dog in life, one great dog in life. A horse is one. And, and at the end of time, you have one great friend. And oddly enough, they, this situation with, with David and Jonathan progressed over a long time. I'm kind of going through the story here so we can get to the, the text. But when David and Jonathan became great friends, well, Saul, the anointed king, he, uh, he felt jealous of David. Let's just put it that way. He sought to kill David couple, two, three times. And, you know, God's all over David. So David was evasive. But the, what's peculiar about David is he is uh, uh, one of those guys that, he's, uh, to me, he was antagonistic. Let me give you an example. Uh, in 1 Samuel, it talks about David. They were in a cave. Uh, Saul, for lack of other words, he said he wanted to put his over his shoes, which means he had to use the restroom. Saul went into the restroom to use the re he went into the cave to use the restroom. Well, Jonathan, can you imagine it's dark, pitch black? John, uh, Saul already people hated him. He was nervous wreck. He's in a cave by himself. He couldn't have a light. Can you imagine having a light trying to use the bathroom? It just don't work. Those things don't work. David took his knife and cut the hem off of his garment and stood outside the cave and waited for him to get done. When Saul come out, he said, I could have killed you, but I didn't. Now right then and there is when David and Saul... David fell under conviction because all of a sudden he realized Saul, for the first time I guess he realized Saul was anointed king and he should treat anointed kings better. And Saul realized for the first time he could have killed me and you're actually the anointed David. You're a better man than I am because I would have killed you probably. But David also, before that, he actually went down in the camp. It says like the camels were the, sand, as they were the sands of the sea. Now picture this. David goes down into this camp. Now you can only imagine Saul had a bunch of people, most likely the elite guard around him. He goes down in this camp and steals Saul's army, his, his uh, armor, all of his stuff. And goes right outside the camp and stands on the hill, waits everybody to get up. And he says, hey, Saul, I could have killed you, but I didn't. Now, many times that probably happened. The Bible records a few, but I'd imagine this happened a whole lot. But David was a warrior. If you read in the scriptures, David fought his whole life from the day he killed that giant in that valley to the day that we're fixing to go to. David fought one battle right after another. 
His mighty men. He encompassed himself about with people from Ziklag. They could actually throw stones and hurl arrows with both the right and left hand. They were ambidextrous. What does that say to us? I remember as a kid years ago when they'd plow a field in the lower bottom in Hickman. I'm actually from Hickman, Kentucky. Don't hold that against me. But anyway, they would plow a field and we would throw dirt clods at each other. Y'all have a dirt clod fight? I don't know if they do it anymore. And I would get so tired, man, I was, man, I was, and I was a good aim. And I, I would throw dirt clods, and, and, but my arm would get to hurt so bad. And uh, I was just hoping I could outlast those guys. But think about it. If I could actually throw as good, I am ambidextrous for a lot of reasons, but I can throw both with right and left hand. I learned that later on in life. But David realized that right out of the gate. He realized if he could get people to throw with both the, right, both the right and the left hand and shoot arrows with both the right and left hand, guess what he's got? What's he got? He got two armies. And boy, when that one army get tired, David said, hey, boys, just swap over to the next hand. Let's go another couple days and we got it licked. The mighty men of NASA, they, was, they were some, these guys that David had around him were some of the toughest, most feared men that ever walked the face of the earth. Like I said, David, like I said, David and Jonathan loved each other. But Jonathan also knew that because Saul's pride, that one day Saul was going to be killed. And when he gets killed, guess what? Whoever takes over was going to kill all the lineage of that family. He knew it was going to be David. Jonathan knew it was going to be David early on. He said, do me a favor, make a covenant with me right now. He said, when you do become king, what I want you to do, can you make, let's, let's shake hands and fellowship, whatever we've got to do, eat banana pudding, I don't care what we've got to do, let's make a covenant right now that when you become king, because you are the anointed one, I want you to do me a favor, don't kill, don't kill all the people in my family. Will you please not do that? They shook hands. That was it. And later on, guess what? Gilboa comes along, they're having a battle. Saul and Jonathan and two sons. Saul lives long enough to see all of his sons die. Jonathan dies. Other two sons die. Saul's uh, armor bearer was there. He said, he, our, Saul was apparently hurt. He said, go ahead and kill me. Saul fell on his own sword and killed himself. His armor bearer turns right around and kills himself. Well, guess what? That's pretty much wipes out the lineage as far as we know at that time of Saul in the battle. Okay? Now, let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 9. That's where we'll start today. They asked how long I was going to preach today. I asked if they had a calendar, and they really didn't know. Uh, so I just kind of left it. <laughs> I just kind of left it at the almanac. You know, I just kind of left it at that. Speaking of long-winded preachers, boy, David's daddy, brother Jack, Brother Jack is a, is, I've seen Brother Jack preach the paint off the wall. He's a good preacher. Uh, and silver tongue. He's very gifted. He's a great DLM for our area. Very encouraging guy. Uh, I don't know why I thought of that, but uh, I've, I've heard him preach it many a times. So speaking, especially speaking at the uh, annual meetings. I'd have to speak at annual meetings every year. Man, it was just mundane. Have y'all ever just monotone meetings? <laughs> Jack could get up there, it would be not be monotone. But it is encouraging. All right. Let me read the scripture to you. Get started. Chapter 9. Now David, like I said, he fought all these battles. He's, he's at the end of the... He's, he's, he's fought everybody and on the man. He's the king over Israel. He's, king. He's, he's, he's the guy. He's the main guy. And he's, he's sitting in his tent at the house, wherever you want to say. He's sitting there meditating. He said, And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul 
that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. Remember, he made the covenant with Jonathan. I'm not going to kill everybody. And there was in the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house that I may show kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto him, and unto the king, Jonathan had yet a son, which is lame on his feet. Now, Lame on his feet. What happened was after Jonathan, the news of Jonathan and Saul got out that he, that he was they were dead. The the um, nursemaid of a young man named Mephibosheth, you fix and find out, realized that all the lineage was fixing to be killed. They're going to come after them. See, so in haste she grabbed him up, Mephibosheth, and grabbed him up and. We really don't know how he fell, but he fell. He broke both of his feet. He was lame. He was actually crippled. Well, they, she grabbed him in haste and took out. Well, they end up in a place called Lodabar. Okay? That's how, uh, how we know he was crippled. So, and the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Uh, the, the, the King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodibar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake. And will restore thee all the land, Saul thy father. And thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldst look upon such a dead dog as I am? And then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto the master's son all that pertained to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in fruits that thy master's son may eat and have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master, shall eat bread always at my table. Go on down to 11 at the end of 11. As for Mephibosheth said unto the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's son. In verse 12, and Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on his feet. Now, picture, I want you to think with me just for a second. Mephib, the, the word uh, loaded bar means hard place. It actually means a place with no pastor. Oddly enough, Psalms 23, maketh me lie down in green pastures beside still waters. They're riding a the staff, they comfort me. You, you realize why we're in a green pasture? Because if we, if we go to sleep in a green pasture, we wake up in a green pasture. Amen, I'm always going to be fed. Also down in the valley, the grass grows better down in the valley. We love mountaintop experiences. While I used to preach revivals, I love mountaintop experiences, but... Mountain tops don't grow green grass very well. It grows down in the valley, and a lot of times we don't need the nourishment down in the valley where the green grass is growing. And the still water, I don't think sheep will drink, run, uh, drink out of running water, so Christ said, I want the water to stop so my sheep, my bride, can get a drink as well. But Mephibosheth was stuck in a place called Loaded Bar, hard place. Probably nothing. And he was hiding out. I imagine he was keeping a low profile because he also knew that David was king. He was five years old when he got crippled. So he really had never met David. But he knew of David. He knew of David's mighty men. And he knew if he probably ever breathed a word, anybody ever found out he was down in there. Oddly enough, Ziba knew that he was there and he, you know, he was close to David. We won't go down that road. But 
he was probably afraid for his, life, his whole entire life that David was going to come down there and kill him. Now think about it. Think in your own mind if you're afraid your whole entire life that somebody's going to kill you because your dad's dead. Everybody's dead except for you. And you're crippled. Somebody's feeding you. And here you are in a hard place. And then all of a sudden, David sends a group of men. These are mighty, now think about it, mighty men. These are not just your average Joe Joes. These are not just run-of-the-mill guys. These guys show up down at Lodibar at the front of Mephibosheth's house and said, King David wants to speak to you. He wants you in the palace. I'd imagine if I was Mephibosheth, I'd sit there for a minute. In my mind, I would think, well, I've lived a long time. Today's the day. He's got me. It's either I can either suffer the consequences and drag me there, or I can get on the bus, a chariot, and go on my own. Guys, let me ask you a real quick question. Some of y'all might be in a hard place today as well. Nobody knows about it. Nobody has a clue but you. It might be your bills. It might be your family going heck in handbag. Nobody knows about it. But to you, spiritually, you look like a whitewashed sepulcher. Everything's good. But on the inside, you're just, you're barely hanging on. Can I tell you something? Christ sent a chariot for you. His name is Jesus. He sent that we're crippled. All of us are crippled by a fall. Just like Mephibosheth. And Christ sent that chariot. He's sending it down to your house. He's got 60, 66 books in the maps and 365 fear knots that says, I'm there for you. I'll always be with you. So I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. And if you're in a hard place today, be mindful you have a church full of people that want to love on you and help you through those problems. A lot of times we get backed up in corners especially Christian people have no idea why. We get backed up in corners think, well, we're the only ones that ever gone through this. Baloney. As a deacon, I was a deacon from 93 to 2011. I have seen everything from death to bulimia. I know every, there's not one situation I can think of that I haven't set with families and discussed Christian families. But I'm glad they called on me. Because if you're a deacon in this church, I'm telling you, that's a high calling to sit with a family and help them deal with those struggles. Now, Mephibosheth, do you think David sent um, an old hoopty down there to pick up Mephibosheth? Do you think that David actually sent an old jalopy? I doubt it. I actually doubt I, I believe it'd be like, what's the... Um, there's a, a Prince Ali. You remember the Prince Ali, the cartoon, some young people, Prince Ali, with he got all this entourage coming down through there. To, for anybody at uh, Loaded Bar, that's probably what it looked like. It, was, it could have been four or five men, but man, these guys were probably dressed to the hilt, and they pull up there. Mephibosheth, he can't even walk. Somebody has to get him and carry him. Guys, sometimes we've got to be carried to the altar. Sometimes we've got to be carried to the truth. I hate to say that. Uh, as in ministry, as long as I've been in ministry, uh, I have a group of people around me that carry me to the truth just about every month. Mark, you're doing the right thing. I have a select group of people that don't mind asking me the hard questions. Mark, you've been praying. Mark, you've been doing what you're supposed to be doing. When I got ordained, one of the greatest questions I've ever heard in my entire life was asked to me that it caught me completely off guard, brought me all the way to the truth. I, I see Billy Graham. You know, when you're ordained, they have all the Billy Graham sit at the table. And they ask you... Uh, it's different than, because uh, when I was ordained as a deacon, it was a little bit different. When I was ordained as a pastor, it was really different because it's, they step it up a notch. And, they, and as a Marine, when they use the words interrogation, that bothers me. 
You know, I get on the defensive when they use interrogators from the social security number, name, rank, serial number. That's all I know. I get blank. You know, so, but anyway, when they ordained me as a pastor, one of the Billy Grahams at the table, he said, um, Mark, now think with me. As a Christian, I've been, I've been preaching a long time. Revival's, Mark, as a, as a pastor, what, what's your value system? How would you... How would you set your value system? Put three people in, three things that you value the most. Well, the Christian thing would say, God's people, lost, dying world, God's people. Church. You know, my family didn't even fall into those three. I'm going to be totally honest with you. My family was not part of my three value system people at the top. That's being brought to the truth. Sometimes we need to be as Christians brought to the truth. He stood and looked at me and he said, where's your family fall into that? He said, you know, if you lose your family, you've lost everything. God sanctioned the family. That's the first, first thing on your, on your priority list, on your the things to do list is make sure your family is well taken care of. But I didn't, that's not, was not in my vernacular to even say that at that time. I had some lessons to learn. So if you're out here today and you think you're, uh, God's loving you because you're doing everything known to man that sounds and looks and sounds like a Christian, can I tell you, if your family's going to heck in a handbag, that's the first people you need to witness to and talk to and be with. I had to be brought to the truth. And a lot of times, when the truth comes to your door, it's not a very easy pill to swallow. Especially as a pastor. And it was tough. I had to reevaluate things. I'd realized I hadn't took a vacation over 17 years. Not one vacation. That's hard to believe, ain't it? And I've been by, by vocation my whole ministry. I believe that uh, Paul was a tent maker. Christ was a carpenter's son. Mark is an industrial maintenance man. <laughs> I believe that. That's kind of the craziest thing on the man. Uh, and... Because there's a lost and dying world out there in the field today, and I worked nights my whole life. I went on nights in 1983, kicking and screaming. I was on an aircraft carrier, and I was a corporal. They told me, you're going to go on nights. I said, I'm not going to do it. I said, I was a different bird back then, too. I wouldn't say. I used my own set of language. I used language to add to language to make it even sound more like language to you. And uh, I said, I'm not going to nights. I said, yes, you are. So I went, on, went on to, I went on nights, naturally. <laughs> I've drank my first cup of coffee on nights, on a flight deck, under red light. Everything's red light. Hated it, hated it. But I realized later on in life, I've been on nights since 1983 till this very day. There's a lost and dying world and on night shift in a world that makes the world go around. They'll probably never come to church. They're tired, the war slapped down about, they're just at, but I've got an opportunity to witness to every single person I come into contact with I've ever been around on nights. That's why I stay on nights. You gotta make sacrifice. Anyway, Mephibosheth got on in the chariot. He gets to the table. And uh, he goes to the table and David said, you know what? Are you Mephibosheth? Yes, I am Mephibosheth. And why would you even call on me like a dead? I am such a, I'm like a dog. Why would, why would you even need me? Why would you even look on me like this? I'm just nothing. He actually started begging. Don't, I, I understand you're, you're King David. I'm not challenging you and look at me. I'm crippled. I'm not going to do anything to, you know, I'm not treason-minded here. And David said, no, that's not what, basically, that's not what I got you here for. I got you because I actually made a covenant to Saul, your daddy, your great-granddaddy, and Jonathan. But he didn't tell him that. He just said, I love you because I loved your daddy. Now, I want you... He took, David took his own servants. 
and made them servants to Mephibosheth. Isn't that the weirdest thing? Now, why wouldn't he just kill him? Think about it. It would been a lot easier just to kill him. But he did. He said, you'll eat at my table continuously from here on out. All, all the days of your life from here on out, you'll eat at my table. My servants are going to be your servants. And everything that Saul owned is actually going to be yours now. I'm going to restore it to you. I'm going to, this is all going to be yours. Now just think what Saul had. That was a lot. And here's a guy who's been in a loaded bar, hard place with nothing. I mean nothing. Absolutely, people bringing food to him. And he goes from nothing to the king's table, eating continuously. Probably eating not the very good food that normal people prob probably waste food. Who knows, but probably the scraps. He's eating the scraps one day. And that very same day, now he's eating the king's food. And got the king's clothes on and got servants that used to belong to the king. Now, only God can do that. I, I grew up in the projects years ago. Projects were a lot different back then. In the 70s, we had weird things go on. We end up in the projects. I lived there for a long time. I drive three brand new cars right now. It's not about the money. It's about where God's brought you from. Where has God brought you from? Guys, the church today is in a weird place. I truly believe that your church is being lulled to sleep. Rocked to sleep. Why? Because we got everything we need. Truthfully. We're not suffering any food items. We're not dealing with any... Now, some of you might be okay as a holistically. We're just talking about the whole church in general. But Christ has brought us a long way. And we have forgotten how hard it was when we first started. Man, I used to eat neck bones and black-eyed peas. Son, that's the best. And that's still the best thing since sliced bread to me. I'll eat it every day. I grew up on it. My wife said, stuff's going to kill you. I said, let it kill me one day at a time. She lets me eat it about once a month. She, that's, my, that's my comfort. You have comfort food. That's my comfort food. I grew up, that reminds me. What's it going to take to remind you? What's it going to take? Do you remember how it was back? Back? Think with me. When you and your wife fought like cats and dogs and you didn't know what end was up, you couldn't get up and make a good decision. Couldn't go to bed and make a good decision. You couldn't take, um, if you couldn't take a million dollars and make it last a whole month, everybody in the world you knew was named Bill. Everybody wanted some of your money, except you couldn't, you couldn't do anything, it seemed. But I'm going to tell you something. As it was with Moses, so shall I be with thee. Christ was with you then, he's with you now. Problem is, he needs you more now than he did then. He could have killed you back then, got rid of you, but he didn't. He loved you, even though you were crippled by a fall, and you're basically a glorified dirt clod. Then he picked up dust from the earth and breathed life in That's a dirt clod, correct? Amen. He just picked that dirt up, breathed life into it, said, you know what? <clears throat> I'm hanging up on his cross, but them old boys just look like they're they're crippled. <laughs> they're crippled. How in the world could I? Can you think with me? How could I die for something like this? A bunch of dogs like this? Or better yet, his daddy, God said, "How could in the world would I? Why in the world would I send my son to die on a cross for a bunch of heathens like this? Why in the world would I do that?" You know why? He's full of grace. He sees something in us we don't see in ourselves. Problem is, sometimes it takes other people to drag you out of that muck and the mire and get you to a place to where you can acknowledge it and understand God's love for you. 
It's like a Monet painting. If you're in front of a Monet painting, try it sometime. It's hard to see the thing. I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not an artistic guy. I can, be, I can weld anything, cut you anything, make you anything, build you anything, but when it comes to paint, forget about it. Maybe by numbers. But when I'm looking at a Monet painting, I'm looking at this thing, it looks like a bunch of blah. I don't care. It's not a Norman Rockwell painting to me. Two speckled pups under a cucumber wagon, it doesn't agree to me. I'm looking at this Monet painting, it's a high dollar painting, I don't know what is this. But the farther I get away from it, not back away from this painting, the picture is very clear. It gets clearer and clearer and farther. It's not because my gla I need glasses, it's just because I need to get away from it. And sometimes Christian needs people need to gather other Christian people up and say, come on with me and let me get you out of this problem in a little while and back you off of that problem in a little while so you can see what the problem is and therefore we can get to resolving the problem and be this problem of restoration needs to happen. Amen? And that's what's happened to Mephibosheth. He, he was in the process of restoration. And God wants to restore the things in Mephibosheth's life and he wants to restore the things as well as in your life. He's crippled, crippled by a fall. Now, Are you afraid? He said, fear not. He said, David said unto him, fear not, and I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan's sake. He said, fear not. Christ, if I'm not mistaken, there's over 365 fear nots in the Bible, one for every day of the year. Right, 66 books and the maps, read those two. It's in there. He says, fear not. How about you? Are you afraid this morning? Are you afraid of what people might think? Who cares? Who cares what they think? Correct? If David was, when Mephibosheth had to get on that chariot and come to the king's table, could you imagine the fear he had when he got in that chariot? Imagine it. All the way there on the other side of the river, he's coming this long journey. When he gets there, he knows for a fact he's gonna, they're going to kill him. He's afraid. As a lost person, when I was lost, one of the greatest things in my mind, I was afraid to come forward. I was. You know, I was prideful. You're not going to tell me what to do. I got here on my own. I got to leave on my own. I've seen it a lot. If you're dealing with issues in your life, it's hard, it's hard for to admit, hey, as a, especially as a man, full-grown man, hey, I'm afraid. I'm afraid to pray with my family because I'm afraid they might think I'm weak. When was the last time, when was the last time, husband or grandpa, you prayed? We want to pray in school. But you can't even pray at home. God's waiting on you. I don't know what's going through your brain housing group right now. I have no idea. I could pray till I get bruises on my feet, on my face, and wear holes in my shoes on my feet. Would never do you a dime of, dime of good. But when you come to the throne, when you come to pray, guess what God's going to do? He's going to restore you. Maybe you're a Christian, been a Christian a long time. You need reviving. Only you know that. But when you come and you pray, guess what Christ's going to do? I guarantee you're not going to eat neck bones and black eyed peas. You're not going to eat one time and have to worry about that next meal. 
He's going to let you eat at his table always. He's going to be sitting with you. He's going to put you some good clothes on. That's a problem. If you got saved, you've been saved a while, and you're still hanging on to those old things. Remember, Lazarus come out of the grave. And while Lazarus was standing there, he said, he said, loose him and let him free. Y'all loose him. He can't, he can't move them old grave clothes on. Y'all know people like that in your community have been saved and you, you hadn't reached out to them. They might have come here a while. They're down in the loaded bar. They're in their own hard place, wherever that may be. As a Marine, I hate to say this, I, I talk to a lot of Marines. Come out of the battlefield. There's a lot of hard places out there. Bow our heads. Lord, I'm not Mephibosheth by no means. I can walk. <clears throat> I can talk. You allow me to finish school. Go on to school. But I am still crippled by a fall. The fall of man. And I thank you, Lord, for restoring my soul. I pray, uh, dear God, today, if there's someone here, they're going, they're in a loaded bar. Nobody knows what they're going through. I don't even need to know. But they won't bring it to the altar today and, and give it to you. I'm sure that you'll let them eat at your table. There's no doubt in my mind. I pray for that family that, that struggles every single day just to make ends meet. Not only financially, but physically and mentally. I pray to God. They learn to pray. And know that just as David's servants waited on Mephibosheth, you have an entire heaven of servants that will serve us. And your word where it says in Hebrews, Wherefore we're compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses, let's lay aside the sin that easily besets us and run the course and stay on in, in the race and stay on the course that you've placed before us, seeking the author and finish of our faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. That balcony of heaven, those those people that want us, that's gone on to be of the Lord, know that we've got that help. Not counting you. I pray for that young person here today that uh, that needs your help. And most of all, I pray for that person just like I was that was afraid to admit they're lost. They look good on the outside, but their Lord on the inside, they're just as empty as they can be. I pray today would be that day that they ask you into the heart. Lord, I'm going to give it to you. You do what uh, what is best. I thank you for again for this day. I love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, if you have something on your heart, I I'm not going to prolong this, but if you want to pray, I guess one of the hardest things I had to, to learn how to do, even as a pastor, is pray for my family. Pray with my family. Not pray for my family. Pray with my family. I don't know what it is. It's tough. If you lost, I pray that you get somebody. You can stop me. I don't care. Before you leave here. I'll sit. I'll sit till the eastern skies roll open like a scroll to get you to understand how important it is that it's great at God's table. That's how long. If 
your older person here and you, you hadn't prayed for your grandkids now's the time you know how you, you know the song though. I surrender all can you play it then just, just, you know the song I surrender all I will leave it with it I'll close with it I surrender all I surrender play it there it says I surrender all how y'all know how to sing I surrender all all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender but you know what we do this is the way we sing it down deep inside I surrender some I surrender some when it's Lord when it's convenient for me and the opportunity is okay I will surrender some. Guys, I surrender all to Christ. God bless you. Thank you for the day.